Hello, my name is Chris Mack of Fractilia. This talk is entitled Measuring and Controlling Stochastic Variability. A brief agenda. We'll begin with an introduction. I'll talk about stochastic scaling and how it is changing with each new technology node. Very briefly, I'll talk about the causes of stochastic variability and the effects. And finally, I'll move into the main section of the talk, the measurement and control of stochastics. First, let's define the very word. Stochastics in patterning for semiconductor manufacturing is the inherent randomness that exists during patterning of very small dimension features. The reason is very fundamental. At the atomic level, every single process is probabilistic, not deterministic. Everything involves randomness, absorption of photons, chemical reactions that occur in photoresists, how that turns into a feature during post-exposure bacon development. All of these events that occur that cause a feature to be formed are fundamentally probabilistic. But for sufficiently large features, the stochastic variability is averaged out over a larger region and therefore is a small fraction of the mean response, the average behavior. The average behavior is deterministic, and therefore patterning looks deterministic. This dose produces this CD, for example, critical dimension. But at small enough features, that ceases to become the case. And the small features, as we all know, are a product of Moore's law. Stochastic variability has become the big problem with Moore's law. Well, the problem is really that we're a victim of our own success. We've had advances in lithography for 50 years, over 50 years now. And for that time frame, features have shrunk on average about 12% every year. Now, that shrinking has slowed for a while, but we're still trying to push features smaller and smaller each year. Every single feature has stochastic variability. Things like line edge roughness, local uniformity of the critical dimension, edge placement errors, stochastic defects, etc. All of these problems are caused by stochastic variability. And the magnitude of that stochastic vari variability has not shrunk very much in the last 50 years. So there's the problem. We've been shrinking CDs. The impact of stochastic variability on those CDs has remained reasonably constant, and therefore the stochastic variation as a fraction of the CD grows and grows and grows. So that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody really cared. Today, it's a big problem. In fact, it's become the biggest source of variation in semiconductor manufacturing at the leading nodes. Uh, here's a quote from Kurt Ronza, the director of advanced lithography at IMEC. Stochastics are getting worse going to smaller pitches and resolving them is more challenging. Here are a couple of slides from applied materials, from ASML, showing the growing role of stochastics as a function of the feature size for each new generation. To the point where at the advanced nodes today in logic, stochastic variation is more than 50% of the edge placement error uh, budget, for example. The same trends exist for memory, and it's just as big a problem there. The problem is the scaling. As we saw, of course, CDs are scaling to smaller and smaller dimensions. And when we scale errors for control, we must scale errors in proportion to that shrinking critical dimension, the errors that affect CD. Traditional process errors get a little bit worse when you get smaller uh, due to the lower image quality and lithography and other factors. But the errors are about the same, so a little bit worse, but that means we have to reduce the errors at least as fast as the CD, usually a little faster than the CD, in order to keep those errors as the same fraction of the CD. But stochastic variability presents a new scaling problem. Our, our errors are not growing a little bit faster than the CD, they're growing a lot faster than the CD. And it has to do with the fundamentals of counting statistics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time 
going into the details, but if you imagine a volume of, say, photoresist, and there's a certain count of the number of chemical events, photon absorptions, uh, reactions, other things that happen in that volume to make it either soluble or not soluble in developer. Same kind of phenomenon happens during etch as well. As I shrink that volume, the counting statistics increases as the volume goes down. Well, the volume of interest is proportional to the CD cubed. As I shrink, everything must shrink in that volume in terms of its control. So this variability is growing as the CD shrinks to the third power. Think about that. If the CD shrinks by a factor of 0.7, uh, the typical historical node from one node to the next, we shrink CD by 0.7x. Well, that means the stochastic variability increases by 3x. This is a major, major uh, problem, and it makes every single technology node much, much more challenging than the previous node. This challenge uh, is caused by many things. There are many sources of stochastic variations. In the world of 193 immersion, where we're doing multiple patterning uh, and very uh, sophisticated deposition and etch steps, photon shot noise is relatively small. It's not insignificant, but it's much smaller. And the resist and etch and deposition stochastics are dominant. It's process stochastics. But at EUV, we have an added major source of stochastic variation in photon shot noise. In fact, approximately photon shot noise and all the st stochastics of the process, such as the resist, contribute about equally. So that's a much larger uh, source of variation when we use EUV. So how do we reduce stochastic variability? Well, we have to increase the counts of things. That means increasing the dose, for example, the number of photons. We can increase the image quality, the normalized image log slope. Well, increasing the dose, well, that's a problem because that affects throughput in the EUV lithography, and we don't like decreasing our throughput. So we do that today. We have much higher dose than we really want to, but we'd love to be able to make it go down. We're always trying to increase image quality, so this is a normal part of engineering in semiconductor manufacturing. We have some new things we worry about. Uh, that we didn't worry about in the past. For example, increasing resist absorption increases the number of photons that are absorbed. We can increase the resist quantum efficiency. We can reduce the positional variability in the molecules uh, in the photoresist. Uh, and same thing kind of happens in etch, by the way. Um, for example, we can increase the quantities, uh, the concentrations of important molecules like the photo acid generator. Uh, we always need to keep our resist contrast as high as possible and lots of formulation optimizations. These are not easy things to do and they're not easy things to understand. We tend to use a lot of trial and error to, uh, to improve our resist formulations for lowest possible stochastics. So here's our problem statement. We have stochastic variability that is now dominating other sources of variation and is often more than 50% of the error budget of advanced nodes, things like CD control, edge placement control. There is a fundamental precept in control. You can't control what you can't measure. So in order to control stochastics, we must be able to measure accurately the stochastic variability that we're trying to control. Well, this is a, a problem that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. Trilogy uncertainty when measuring stochastics is much larger than when measuring the mean response, mean CD. And it, uh, metrology uncertainty is an interesting part of the air budget in the control. We don't want that. We don't want metrology to be the major uh, portion or a major portion of our budget for control. But it is, and sometimes it's more than 25%. We have uh, traditional SEMs with their traditional solutions that are proving to be inadequate. And the reason is metrology for, for stochastic pros, uh, poses some unique challenges. Random SEM errors in the past, when we only care about the mean response, are averaged away 
and making more measurements. However, it can't be averaged away for better precision when we're trying to measure the variation. Systematic sim errors also require different treatments for stochastics, and we're going to talk about these today because there are solutions uh, to stochastic metrology and control. To finish up our introduction, I'd like to talk about the four major stochastic effects. Now, there's lots of things that stochastic does in patterning, but we tend to categorize all of these effects into four major phenomena. First, the roughness of the edges or the widths of the features over some length of, of a feature. Uh, feature edges in, are rough. We characterize them with what's called the line edge roughness or the line width roughness. These rough edges affect uh, gate leakage, fire resistance, chip power, things that matter for the performance of the device. We also have local critical dimension uniformity, which affects chip speed and yield. That is, nearby devices that should be nominally the same are different because of stochastic variations. Like CD, we can also talk about edge placement. Uh, local edge placement errors are the random variations in the positions of the features that we're printing. So the, both the CDs and the positions vary randomly because of stochastics, which affects yields and reliability, sometimes quite extensively. Missing uh, or, or merged contacts, bridges, or breaks in our features are called stochastic defects. And we can, it's sort of a catastrophic version of local CDU or LAR, LWR, uh, where the variations cause fundamental uh, changes to the connectivity of our devices. That, of course, affects yield and reliability. So, the first step in controlling stochastics is measuring stochastics' effect. As I said, we need to measure these things before we can control them, and we need to measure all four of these fundamental uh, stochastic problems in patterning, LER, LWR, local CDU, local edge placement error, and stochastic defects. The local in these names refer to the variation that's not caused by global phenomenon that we're used to controlling, but is in fact only caused by stochastic variations. Now, because of course, because we're measuring really, really small phenomena, dominant metrology tool this are scanning electron microscopes, either the CD-SEMs that we've been used to using and the new large area e-beam inspection tools, which are taking up more and more of the challenges of metrology. SEMs have significant problems when measuring stochastic effects. I'm going to talk about those problems and why they're unique to measuring stochastic effects rather than just measuring the mean values of our metrology outputs. Fortunately, there are solutions that will enable our existing SEM hardware to supply accurate results for all four of these stochastic effects. So what are the problems with traditional metrology? Well, one way of looking at it, there's several ways of looking at it, but one is traditional metrology takes an image and then tries to tell you what's on the image. Well, what's on the image includes on the wafer plus random and systematic errors caused by the SEM itself that bias our results. The random noise when measuring the mean response can be averaged out through multiple measurements, but if we're trying to measure the variation in an edge or the variation in a width, then that random noise produces a bias. It always biases the roughness upward, makes it larger local CDU and edge placement error larger than it would be. And you can't make it go away by making more measurements. We also have systematic variations in, it, in intensity across the SEM field, distortion, scan errors, that make the low frequency roughness appear to be larger. What we need to do is to unbias our stochastic measurements so that we can measure and subtract out the SEM errors from the measurement, because after all, we don't know, want to know what's on the image. We want to know what's on the wafer. And the only way to do that is to measure and subtract out the SEM errors. But we need something more because our traditional way of measuring roughness only looks at the three sigma variation in an edge or width, and that's not enough. 
this is one of my favorite uh, exercises to do. Here's four edges. Look at those four edges. They're all rough. Each edge has some roughness, some variation of, uh, about an ideal straight line. Now, would anyone look at these four edges and say that they're all the same? They have the same roughness. No, I think we would all look at them and say there's something different about them. Well, here's the thing. I made up these edges so that they all have the exact same three sigma roughness. Well, what's different about them? Well, three sigma varies the uh, measures the variation perpendicular to the edge. The amplitude of the back and forth perpendicular to the edge is the same for all four these edges. What's different is how that variation is spread along the length of the line. So we need some other tool besides just a three sigma value to tell us how the roughness varies along the edge of the line. To do this, we use an important mathematical tool called the power spectral density. This not only describes the roughness more accurately, more completely, but the outputs of the power spectral density analysis can be very useful for controlling and optimizing stochastic variations. You can use it to optimize a resist, a resist processing, etch processes, deposition processes, etc. What is the power spectral density? Well, I won't go into the details of it. It's a well-known uh, mathematical tool for spectral analysis. It's used in many, many fields of science and engineering. It's the variance in the edge or width per unit frequency. Well, the PSD, the variance, describes the perpendicular variation, just like the three sigma does. Um, variance, which is the standard deviation of the edge position, squared. But we do that as a function of length, and the length is scale is 1 over the frequency, or the frequency is 1 over the length scale. So for short lengths, we have high frequencies. For long lengths, we have low frequencies. And then we have the variance, or the edge deviation, per unit frequency as a function of frequency. And we see a very typical response here showing different regions of behavior. We have uncorrelated roughness when the PSD is flat. That's a white noise behavior. When the PSD is varying with frequency, we have correlated roughness. And then we have this transition between the two. And this, these different regions are caused by different physical effects. So by measuring this power spectral density, we can learn about how rough it is at low frequencies, something called PSD zero, or the zero frequency PSD. We can learn about where it transitions from uncorrelated to correlated phenomenon. Something called the correlation length tells us that. And then the slope of this downward trend is called the roughness exponent. And finally, the area under the curve is the variance. And the square root of the variance is the standard deviation, what we normally call LER or LWR. By measuring all of these parameters, we have information that's critical to describe the sources of stochastic variability and their impact on device features. Well, with the power spectral density tool, we can now look at a couple of these different rough edges that we saw two slides ago and show how different they behave in frequency space. Now remember, these two edges, I picked two out of the four, these two edges have the same three sigma, but they have very different power spectral densities. And in fact, when we look at them in the same image, image themselves, we, we can see that they're different. In fact, most of us would look at the top one and say, oh, that's much rougher than the bottom one. But in fact, it's not. Remember, they have the same three sigma. The difference is in the frequencies. The top one has more high frequency roughness and less low frequency roughness. The bottom one has more low frequency roughness, as we see here, and less high frequency roughness. The difference, correlation lengths, PSD zeros, will result in different different device impacts and be caused by different phenomenon in the processes uh, or different magnitudes of phenomenon in the process. So by measuring the power spectral density, we can not only make predictions about how our devices will behave, but we can also 
help to understand the causes of stochastic variability. All right, so we need to measure these things, and we measure them scanning electron microscope, sigma and the full power spectral density. There are two major problems we have to solve. The first problem is noise bias. Noise in the SEM image are these salt and pepper bright, brighter or darker pixels caused by really kind of a stochastic variability in the SEM imaging the cell. The limited number of electrons that we use to measure our sample. And, and noise in the image, the grayscale pixel noise in the image, looks a lot like roughness on the edge. So that our measured roughness is equal to the true roughness plus the impact of edge detection noise caused by that grayscale noise. Well, this noise always biases our measurement higher. It's, it's not a, a random thing that you can average away. Every time you measure it, it will always be higher than it really is. And this bias is not fixed. It varies from SEM tool to SEM tool. It changes with metrology settings and sample properties like CD and pitch or thickness of the sample features that you're measuring. So we have a, a true value plus an unknown variable. And that's what we're measuring. Not very pleasant. The other problem is noisy images are hard to measure, hard to detect the edges, so we apply a filter. The typical filter smooths away some of the grayscale noise and makes it easier to detect the edges. But this filtering is, again, not, oh, not necessarily required, but frequently used. This filtering also biases a roughness because it smooths not just the grayscale image noise, but the roughness itself that biases our answers always downward. That bias is not a fixed number. It's a random variable. It varies from tool to tool, varies with metrology settings, and it varies with sample properties. So how do we deal with this? These two random and unknown biases for measurement. Well, there's only one way that I'm aware of. The solution is to not use any filtering whatsoever and then measure and subtract out the impact of image noise on our measurements. This is not an easy thing to do because, as I said, noise in the image makes edge detection very difficult. But if we do it right, we'll get an unbiased roughness measurement, unbiased local CDU measurement, unbiased local edge placement error measurement. There's also systematic errors in our SEM. We'll show some examples of this in a few slides. We have across SEM field non-uniformities. So here's a, a SEM field showing the CD non-uniformity for an array of contact holes. Where it's brighter, meaning higher CDs uh, in, in the middle, and then out at the edges, it's got lower CDs. This is a systematic variation caused by the SEM. We can observe by averaging together many, many images of the same patterns. There's also a grayscale variation from top to bottom, which is part of the cause of these kinds of variations. Uh, we also have scanning errors. SEM scanning errors, uh, shown here, produce edge which is not vertical, not ideal, but has some variability caused by errors in the scanning of the electron across the sample. Uh, these scanning errors are usually systematic, but sometimes very randomly as well. And they are often on the order of a half a nanometer. Um, but sometimes they can be even much larger, which I'll show you an example of. All of these errors can be measured and subtracted out. And if we want accurate and precise measurements, we need to do that. So what are the impacts of these random and systematic SEM errors? Well, for traditional measurements of mean CD, etc., we can mitigate the impact of these errors through averaging. We simply measure more, average away the variabilities, and get a reasonable value for the mean. But when we want to measure the variation about the mean, stochastic variations like LWR or local CDU, these errors affect both precision and accuracy. The bias LWR can be up to 50%, sometimes higher. LCDU bias frequently as much as 
this is an accuracy error that you cannot fix with more measurements. We also have tool-to-tool -tool variations, which can be significant. 10% is very typical variation in LWR from one CDSM tool to the next, but it can be as high as 20% as well. Now, many of our decisions in the fab require that we do much better than this because we have a, some signal, but it's buried in a sea of noise, and we want to spend our time chasing the signal, not the noise. So there is a new paradigm for how we can go about making these measurements. And this paradigm involves first detecting the edges in a way that enables good edge detection with low noise without filtering. The way I do this is with an inverse line scan model, physics-based modeling of the SEM itself. Then we need to measure our features in contexts, not in isolation. Not one feature at a time, but a group of images with, with identical kinds of features on it that we measure in order to measure and subtract out the SEM errors, both random and systematic. And with all of these things, we can maximize the information that can be extracted from every SEM image, telling us not only what's on the wafer, what the image is like, what the problems of our CD SEM tools are. First, we need an edge detection that is less sensitive to noise. And at Fractilia, we've developed a Fractilia inverse line scan model or film. And here, the power spectral density of the roughness of these features is used as a way of not only measuring what's on the wafer, but measuring the properties of the CDSEM tool itself. This noise floor, so-called noise floor, is where it levels out at high frequencies caused by noise in the SEM. And without any filtering, we can measure that noise floor and subtract it out. It needs to be low to begin with. That's what the Fractilia inverse line scan model does. Is it gives a much, much lower noise. In this case, the edge detection noise is about one nanometer whereas the traditional measurement gave us four nanometers and we didn't use any filtering. A huge difference in the noise, and we need that difference in order to accurately measure and subtract out that noise. If the noise is too high, we can't measure it accurately. So that's the first step. Second step is once we can measure that noise, we can take it out. Here I show a very straightforward experiment that anyone can do where you measure the same patterns but with different frames of averaging on the SEM, two frames, eight frames, 32 frames shown here, directly affects the amount of noise in the image. Well, the wafer didn't change. What's on the wafer is exactly the same for each of these measurements. But when I look at the biased value of the LWR, for example, I see a huge variation in the measured LWR as I change the number of frames of averaging. So comparing four frames to 16 frames, I see a 100% factor of two difference in the answer. But if I can measure and subtract out the noise, as I've done here, I see unbiased LWR that varies by only a few percent. This is work in collaboration with IMEC, by the way. The next paradigm, important paradigm point, is to measure features in context, not in isolation. This previous result were 50 images. Every image had uh, 20 or so, or excuse me, about 50 or so uh, features on each image. So that was a large number of features that we can average together in order to measure out noise and subtract them. How do we do that? Well, we take an integrated approach, many features and many images measured as a whole, not individually. For the batch of images, we characterize the SEM random and systematic errors, which we need lots of images to do. Then we remove these errors from the images or from the detected edges as appropriate, depending on the error. After we've removed these errors, we then measure CD, LWR, edge placement error, etc., per feature. And finally, we combine these results statistically, and there's a few more opportunities to remove other errors at this stage. The result is statistical rigor and the highest possible accuracy decision. One of the kinds of errors that we can determine in this way are scan errors. We do that using stacked contours. Take the measured contour, the measured edge of every single feature on every single image 
and stack them all up on top of each other and find the average contour. Well, the average contour in this way is averaging away all of the, the mask effects, the litho effects, the etch effects, all the stochastic errors will average away to zero with the right sampling plan. The only thing that can remain if you sample properly is the systematic metrology errors. And therefore, we have a window into seeing variations that are extremely small. In this case, we see a variation of about 0.4 nanometers in the edge position. That is quite systematic with a, with a very systematic signature to it. Well, 0.4 nanometers is usually hidden by roughness of the feature itself, which is on the order of a couple of nanometers. So you'll never see that 0.4 nanometers unless you do a lot of averaging using these stacked contours. One thing we discovered in this work with IMEC was that each CDSEM tool has a unique scan error signature. There are uh, six different tools, three different generations, tool tools each, and we find that they're quite different. One of these tools, generation two, number one, in fact, has a significantly higher variability, uh, uh, or rather systematic scan error, compared to all the rest. The others are about a half a nanometer. This one's about one and a half nanometers in variation. That uh, variation from tool to tool needs to be taken out to match up your tools to get good metrology and manufacturing. What's the impact? Well, here is the same wafer measured on six tools with a range of 0.42 nanometers in the biased LWR. The variations in noise and systematic errors cause this large variation in the, uh, uh, the measured LWR. But simply by taking these exact same images, measuring and subtracting out the errors, we can reduce that variability by a factor of 10. Now, no changes were made to the CDSEM tools here. We only analyzed the images more carefully. Well, uh, 0.4 nanometers, which is about 8% in the biased LWR case, uh, is too big of a range to be useful for making decisions about which process is better. You can make a decision based on which SEM the wafer was run on rather than which process produces lower roughness. Another result of this um, uh, accurate measurement of roughness is better correlation to wafer defectivity, which we also need to measure. We can measure and quantify the bridges and breaks and missing and merged contexts or pillars. We can use unbiased LWR or uh, local CDU as a proxy minimize line space defectivity uh, with fewer measurements. And here's a study that from IMEX showing that LWR was directly correlated to defectivity rates for lines and spaces when the LWR was properly measured, that is an unbiased LWR. Now missing and merged contact holes, more difficult, um, but we can also measure and subtract out noise in LCDU, but we need even more because missing contacts have a non-Gaussian probability of occurring. If we take a, a three sigma value and we extrapolate it, assuming a Gaussian distribution of holes, we do not get an accurate prediction of how many missing contact holes there might be in a process with billions of contact holes. So LCDU in and of itself, can't tell us everything we need to know. Can't tell us something about these fat tails. So what we do instead is we can model these fat tails with a lithography-based model of how contact holes go missing, and we can make predictions that are more accurate than just using the local CDU. Well, because of all of these things, we can do better in our stochastics metrology, and we need that improvement in metrology. We need it for doing better job of predicting low-level stochastic defectivity, as I just mentioned, for material and process tool selection for low stochastics, for process optimization, 
for the understanding the impact of OPC on st stochastics and stochastic aware OPC model calibration, root cause analysis, before and after etch analysis, optimizing and matching our metrology tools, reducing resist shrinkage through lower e beam dose, and finally, most importantly, through manufacturing, process monitoring, and control. So, in summary, in order to control stochastics, we have to measure it better than we do today. We need edge detection with minimum sensitivity to image noise. Uh, we need to measure our images as a batch rather than in isolation so that we can measure and subtract out random and systematic SEM errors. And this allows the measurement of unbiased values of LER, LWR, local CDU, local edge placement error, as well as a better measurement of stochastic defectivity based on CD variations. This produ produces an accurate measurement of all four major stochastic effects, and that's required for material and tool selection, process optimization, manufacturing, monitoring, and control. And with each new technology generation, these needs just become more extreme. Well, thank you for your attention.